Thank you so much for the invitation to be here with you today or tonight, possibly. Um, and apologies that I can't be with you um, live. If all goes well, I will be traveling uh, on an airplane right now uh, while you're listening to this talk. Um, but I do wish I could be there. Um, I want to talk about a topic that is close to a lot of the things that I've studied over the past few years about um, where algorithms can go wrong and how to fix them. So I think that there is a lot of attention to the fact that algorithms can do bad things, that they can reproduce and scale up a lot of the ugly things about our society and about our healthcare system. Um, and I think more broadly than health, wherever we find that algorithms are being applied to help humans make important, very high stakes decisions, um, they run into problems. And this is true not just in healthcare, but also in um, algorithmic applications to criminal justice, to finance and lending to education. So in a lot of these areas, there's more and more evidence that algorithms can do bad things, that they can automate some of the um, problematic parts of our society, whether that's um, prejudice against different races, against people who speak different languages um, and, and, and other kinds of things, and scale up those biases in ways that we really don't like. I want to take a more optimistic view of algorithms today that draws on some other work that I've done. So I've done a lot of work on auditing algorithms and demonstrating that they can be biased, um, but I'm also uh, cautiously optimistic about the possibility that we can actually use algorithms to do better, to make our healthcare system and society more generally less biased. Um, and, and I want to tell you about some of that work and also highlight along the way some areas where you can contribute to this work um, and where you can actually do research in some of these areas, um, because I think this kind of work is going to be very important as we seek to build algorithms that are just and fair um, rather than algorithms that are biased. So I want to start by um, switching gears and telling you about a particularly problematic area. Um, and I think a lot of these data will come from the US, but I do think that they'll apply more broadly. Um, and, and the problem that I want to tell you about today is the problem of pain. So pain um, is everywhere in society. And, and in my personal practice as an emergency doctor, it's really one of the most striking things about practicing medicine is how many people come in to the hospital in pain looking for an explanation and looking for relief. But like almost everything in our society, it's not just that pain is everywhere. Pain is also very unevenly distributed in society. And specifically, it is much more common in some groups than in others. So in the US, um, I'm going to focus on the uh, black-white disparity, but a lot of what I'll tell you um, is, is going to hold true for lots of other disparities, um, both in the U.S. and elsewhere. But um, to take the U.S. example, if you look at surveys where people are asked the question, were you in severe pain over the past one to two days, um, about twice the number of Black patients report being in severe pain relative to white patients. And that's similar for low income versus high income, uh, lower educational attainment versus higher educational attainment. So all of these um, things about pain are very unfairly distributed in society and they affect um, the most disadvantaged people already. Now, um, one thing that you might think is that um, there's a simple explanation for this, which is that um, sure, uh, these patient populations have more pain because they have a higher prevalence of conditions that cause pain. So we're going to be studying um, as our model organism, knee pain in particular, and we're going to be studying the most common cause of knee pain, which is arthritis of the knee. Um, and so you might think that, yes, there are differences in the degree of pain that different populations report, um, but maybe that's just because, um, for example, Black patients have higher rates of arthritis in the knee, and that's why they report more knee pain. But the story is actually not so simple. And the reason that we know it's not so simple is because there are these very elegant studies that compare patients whose knees look the same on the x-ray. So they take patients where the degree of osteoarthritis is the same in x-rays, and then they compare the pain scores that those two patients report. Um, and they do that for lots of different patients, but now they've held constant the degree of arthritis in the knee. Um, and when you do that, um, what you find is that you take these two patients whose knees look the same, and these patient populations still report more pain 
even though their degree of disease severity in the knee um, is the same. And that's true for the black-white disparity as well as all of the other disparities that I've mentioned. So how has the literature explained this? Well, I think that the, the literature has basically said, we've looked at the knee and these knees look the same. The degree of disease severity is the same but these populations are reporting more pain than these populations. So if it's not a difference in the way their knees look on the x-ray, then maybe it's something else and maybe it's outside the knee. One possible explanation is a variety of things that you know could sound uh, pejorative, uh, negative in a way, um, but, but I think is based on very rigorous research. For example, um, stress. So um, we know from elegant studies done in laboratories that if you take two patients who are under um, uh, different levels of stress and apply the same physical stimulus, the more stressed patient is actually going to report a higher level of pain. Similarly, we know that anxiety and depression can manifest as pain. And we also know that um, some populations have less mental resources and bandwidth to cope with painful stimuli, and that can also lead to higher reports of pain. Another explanation is that it's possible that doctors just treat these patients differently or they have different access um, to medications that could help with their pain. But all of these explanations have one thing in common, which is that they're not in the patient's knee, they're somewhere else. They're um, in their heads, they're in society, in the medical system, uh, but they're not in the knee. So I just wanna make this very real by walking through a concrete scenario um, that a doctor might encounter with a patient. So a patient comes into your office, you're the doctor, um, and she complains of pain. And you, one of the things that you might do as the doctor is refer that patient for an x-ray. Um, if this literature is right, and that patient happens to be black or poorer or lower um, education, then it's more likely for that x-ray to come back looking normal or at least not that impressive. And so you're going to be left with a patient with a report of pain, but their x-ray doesn't look too bad. And so you're going to not send that patient to a knee specialist, to an orthopedic surgeon, for example. You're going to start looking elsewhere um, for, um, for causes of pain. Um, and as a result, you're going to start asking about stress or depression. You might uh, refer the patient to a therapist, or you might just say something that a lot of doctors say to a lot of patients, which is, well, your knee is fine. Um, I don't have any solutions for you. So uh, come back later. Um, either your pain will go away uh, or it won't. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll have to see. So this is not a great situation for either the doctor or the patient. Um, and, and all of this is because of this mystery in the literature. Um, but all of the things that I've told you so far depend a lot on what we mean by disease severity. So I've left this implicit, and now I wanna make this explicit. So everything I've told you about the studies that held the appearance of the knee constant, all of that depends on a way to measure the severity of disease in someone's knee. So how do we measure that? Uh, well, I will now show you the state of the art in the measurement of the degree of disease severity in a patient's knee. It's this. It's a human radiologist looking at a knee x-ray and judging the degree of arthritis um, according to certain very um, precise and explicit criteria. And so I'll just tell you about one of these. It's the most widely used of these. Um, objective grading scales that are based on the x-ray appearance. Um, and this one is called the kelgren lawrence grade. Um, so the papers that were um, published to describe the system uh, were published by these two doctors, Dr. Uh, Kelgren and Dr. Lawrence, um, based on studies that they had done in the 1940s and the 1950s. Um, and what these studies did is they looked at the knees under x-ray of coal miners in a certain part of England um, and they compared them to uh, people who worked in an office. And when you go back and you look at these studies, the studies don't really mention the race or sex breakdown of the population because all of the patients that they were studying were white and male. Um, and so this might make you wonder, well, maybe this is a clue to the mystery that we're dealing with. Maybe this is why 
um, we're not finding the evidence of disease severity in the knees of black patients or, or other kinds of patients that we see today, but that weren't in these original studies. It's because these studies that determine how we define arthritis might have been missing something. So this was very interesting. Um, and you might think, uh, because of the um, title of the symposium and my talk, um, that this would be a good job for an algorithm to solve. So if we're worried that human radiologists are missing certain causes of pain that might be affecting these groups more than, um, more than they're affecting um, other groups, then maybe an algorithm could help figure this out. There's one problem though, which is that we don't in the literature today have a very good way of getting algorithms to help. Why is that? Well, because when you look at the literature and you see how researchers build algorithms to help solve this problem, what they do is they train the algorithm to match the performance of a human. So they feed in a bunch of x-rays and they ask the algorithm to learn what would a radiologist say about this x-ray? What kelgren lorentz grade, for example, would a radiologist assign to this particular x-ray? And then that's how the algorithm learns. So the algorithm is being trained to match human performance on this task. But of course, that's exactly what we don't want to do if we're worried that humans might be missing something by virtue of the fact that they're learning um, from a very particular kind of scientific knowledge that might be biased against certain groups of people who were absent from the populations in those original studies. So what we did in this exercise was to try to build a different kind of algorithm. So the algorithm today, the, the way we run the machine learning playbook is to say, well, we're going to try to get this algorithm to learn from the radiologist. So as I said, we're going to input these x-rays and we're going to output the kelgren lorentz grade on a scale from zero to four. Um, that's how we do it today. Now, there's um, another person that we might want to ask about um, the knee. Uh, and it's not the radiologist, but it is another human whose opinion about the knee really matters, and that's the patient. So instead of training the algorithm to learn from the radiologist and to assign the kelgren lorentz grade that a radiologist would give, we're gonna train an algorithm to listen to the patient's experience of pain and learn from that instead of learning from the doctor. Now, I'll just point out one thing that will come up again later, which is that finding the data to do this kind of work is not easy. It's very, very easy to find data sets that link x-rays with a radiologist's interpretation of that x-ray. That kind of data is sitting um, on the server of every hospital in the world um, because that's how the medical system works. We actually um, have a lot of data that matches the x-ray with what the doctor says, but it's a lot harder to find data sets that match x-rays with what the patient says. And I think that's a reflection uh, in general of how the medical system values what doctors say uh, about patients much more than what patients say about patients. So we were very, very lucky um, to find a data set that was um, collected and made public by the National Institutes of Health in the US that took a large cohort um, of patients from all across the country in the United States with lots of different races um, represented. Um, and, and we had those data the x-rays linked to not just what the radiologist said about the x-ray, but also the patient's report of pain over time. And once we had those data, it, was, it became a very straightforward machine learning playbook where we would take a bunch of the x-rays, we would feed those x-rays into a very um, run-of-the-mill convolutional neural network, and we would output the degree of pain that the algorithm predicted the patient was going to report um, based on the appearance of the x-ray. So the algorithm only has access to the pixel matrix of the knee x-ray. It doesn't see anything else about the patient. And I just wanna point out uh, a subtle point here, but a very important one. We're asking the algorithm to look at the x-ray and predict what a patient would say about the degree of pain in that x-ray. Now, a lot of people are a little bit suspicious of these pain scores because they're subjective because they're noisy. Um, and in fact, I think a lot of people think they're basically random. You know, it depends a lot more on whether the patient was in a good mood or a bad mood um, or what the patient had for breakfast than it does on, you know, a, a real physiological uh, signal. But 
if we find that the algorithm can successfully predict the degree of pain from an x-ray, that means that there is something in that x-ray that is predicting the pain. So the pain is not a random number. It's not about the patient's mood. It's not about what they had for breakfast. There is something in that knee that is telling us whether that patient is gonna report the knee as painful or not. And that's a very important point because it lets us tie the pain to a particular part of the image. So I'll um, just share some very high level results, um, but all of this was published in the paper in Nature Medicine uh, from a couple of years ago, the reference is below. So if we look in our population of patients at the difference in pain between black and white patients, um, we find that the difference is 11 points. Well, what does 11 points mean? Um, on this scale, someone with no pain has a score of 100. Someone with severe pain in their knee has a score of 86 or below. So a difference of 11 between black and white means that black patients are more than half the way towards severe pain uh, relative to no pain um, uh, than, than white patients. So this is a big, big difference in pain um, already just on average comparing black patients to white patients. When we adjust for the degree of arthritis in the knee, we find that that does explain part of the difference. So it explains 9% of that difference in pain. So this unexplained difference between black and white, 9% of that is due to differences in uh, the degree of osteoarthritis in the knee. But when we adjust for our algorithmic pain score, we find that the algorithm can explain much, much more. It explains nearly half of that previously unexplained gap in pain between black and white patients. And that's almost five times more than the KLG in that standard measure. Um, we find similar results, uh, although a bit less pronounced for differences between high and low income individuals and between higher and lower education individuals as well. Now, I just wanna um, point out that there are a number of things that could explain this um, uh, that we check for in the paper. Um, and I'll just mention a few of them now. Uh, I won't go through them in detail, but they're, they're all described in that paper. Um, one thing that you might worry about is that the algorithm is seeing the race of the patient and it's not finding anything about the knee in particular. It's just reconstructing that a patient is black or white and making the link that black patients report higher degrees of pain. So one thing we can do is we can control for race directly. So we can see, okay, the algorithm has a certain ability to explain pain. If we control for race directly, does that affect the algorithm's ability to reconstruct the pain score? Um, if all the algorithm were doing was seeing whether someone was black and white and inferring more or less pain from that, that should take away the predictive power of the algorithm. And what we find is that it doesn't, it hardly changes the predictive power of the algorithm. We have similar analyses for um, making sure it's not a site specific thing. We have lots of different sites in the study. So if some sites have more or less pain, that could do it. We also um, show that the algorithm is finding new signals. So you can't explain the algorithm score just by, um, uh, by looking at the radiologist's very detailed report. Um, the algorithm is finding something that's genuinely new that the radiologists are not seeing. Why is this important? Well, because the way we look at someone's x-ray determines what we do with them in a clinical setting. And specifically, it determines whether someone gets access to knee replacement surgery. So um, knee replacement surgery, I, I don't know if any of you have had friends or relatives who have had one of these surgeries. It can be completely life-changing. It can make the difference between being stuck at home and unable to um, get to the bathroom or do your errands um, or, or go shopping to living a normal life. So these surgeries are transformative. Now, who gets access to surgery? Well, you need to have two things. The first thing you need um, is severe pain. So, you know, that's one of the important things that makes you a candidate for surgery. But you also need to have severe disease in your knee. We don't want to replace the knee of someone whose knee pain is coming from stress or depression or, or, or something else. So we really want to make sure before we give someone a new knee that the cause of the pain is in the knee. So we do an exercise where we look in our sample at these guidelines. So the guidelines say you have to have severe pain and severe uh, disease in your knee. Um, and we figure out, okay, how many patients are eligible for a knee replacement under the current guidelines, which is pain and radiologist 
thinks your knee looks bad. Then what we do is we swap in the algorithm's disease severity measure instead of the radiologist. So instead of the you know, 10 uh, most severe disease patients in high pain getting surgery, according to the radiologist, we take the 10 highest ranked patients um, that the algorithm thinks uh, have severe disease in their knee. And what we find is that when we do that and we hold constant the number of surgeries, we would double the fraction of black patients' knees who are eligible um, for knee replacement surgery. So this is a big change in who gets access um, to, the, to the surgery and could be one of the things that explains the huge disparities in access to knee replacement surgeries that we see between black and white patients in the US. So I think this is one aspect of a really important point, which is that what do we want from algorithms in medicine? Well, we want them to do better than humans. We don't want them to just reproduce our errors and biases. We want them to find genuinely new signal in these complex medical data that we give to them um, so that we can improve on the current way that we make decisions. In other words, algorithms should be learning from nature, not just from human doctors. Um, but those data on patient outcomes, for example, on, on experiences, uh, on you know, downstream fractures, on outcomes from knee replacement surgeries, all of those things are locked away inside of health systems in the US, inside of other entities, uh, government agencies, things like that um, across the world. And this is a big problem because it means that the people who have really interesting questions that they wanna answer with data, who have really important topics, whether it's about um, algorithmic fairness, whether it's about medical discoveries, those people can't access the data. The data are locked up in, in, inside of certain institutions. And this whole universe of researchers who would love to do creative things with it um, in the AI space, in any space, can't get access to it. And I think that this lack of data is really holding back a scientific field, um, the field at the intersection of computer science and statistics and medicine um, and all of these things that you know, we, we've all been hearing about today. And I wanna tell you that um, we're taking a couple of baby steps towards a solution. Um, and, and I hope that part of that solution might involve some of the people who are, um, who are in this virtual room today. So a couple of years ago, one of my co-authors, uh, Sendhil Malanathan, who's at the University of Chicago, um, Sendhil and I uh, co-founded a nonprofit organization called Nightingale Open Science. Um, and thanks to philanthropic funding um, from a number of donors in the US, what we're able to do is to work with health systems, with companies, with governments, and this can be at the leadership level or at the individual researcher level. And we build up data infrastructure. So as one example, um, we're working with a researcher um, who's a radiologist at one institution to get a lot of x-ray images of the knee and link those images to downstream patient outcomes like fractures and knee replacements and outcomes from those surgeries. In another setting, we are buying digital slide scanners for pathology specimens and generating whole slide images from physical samples that were literally gathering dust on the shelf of a cancer center. And we're linking those data to outcomes um, from cancer registries, from um, uh, surgical and, and medical management outcomes um, and long-term metastatic progression. So we build up that data infrastructure and then we curate an interesting data set around a really important medical problem. So I told you about this problem about unexplained pain um, that affects some people more than others. But you know, medicine is full of these problems. So which patient develops metastatic disease and which, which patient doesn't is a deep unsolved mystery. And algorithms by looking at these whole slide images um, have the potential to not only predict better and try to identify who needs watchful waiting, um, who needs immediate attention, um, they can also generate fundamentally new insights into the science of medicine. Um, and we really focus these data sets and these, um, and these efforts on high priority problems and high priority populations um, who are usually the ones who benefit from algorithms. Um, so we work with researchers and health systems, we create these data sets, they go off and do research themselves with the funding and the, um, uh, and the extra help that we give them. And in exchange, we get a de-identified version of that data set and we put it up on our cloud platform where we can make it available to nonprofit researchers 
for free. Um, so today you can go to uh, nightingalescience.org or just Google Nightingale Open Science um, and you can get access to um, five data sets of electrocardiograms, of x-rays, of digital pathology specimens, all linked to these ground truth outcomes and that speak to really important medical questions. Um, and all of that is on a standard cloud platform. It's free. You'll recognize how to use it if you've worked with any imaging data before. It's a standard Jupyter notebook with all of the packages you need um, to do basic deep learning stuff um, and, and not so basic deep learning stuff. Um, so it'll look exactly like a, um, a regular data environment for you. Um, and, and, and you'll be able to work on these problems too. Um, and a lot of these things really speak to the disparities um, uh, that, that, that I've been talking about today, um, as you'll see from the uh, extensive data set documentation that we provide. Um, and so I think this is you know, one way in which we can start opening up a lot of these um, interesting questions and, and, and allowing lots of different researchers to work on these things because answering these questions shouldn't depend on us happening to find a data set that was assembled by the National Institutes of Health. The other work that I've done in algorithmic bias has been because we were lucky enough to have access to the data set where we could show that a particular algorithm was biased. Um, and we can't hold back the future of the field um, because of the shortage of data. I think this is a big bottleneck um, to the field in general. So I want to thank you all for, uh, for listening. Um, please go check out Nightingale Open Science, and I hope to see you all on that platform. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here to be talking about algorithms, data, and interaction, a three-pronged strategy for the future of medical AI. So my lab focuses on how can we safely automate medical decision-making tasks to improve patient outcomes. And I think the solution to this takes three parts. The first is how do we go about building algorithms that don't require too many labeled data and can leverage a lot of unlabeled data? How do we transform the paradigm from these private data sets in hospitals to diverse public data sets? And finally, how do we set up systems in which we're measuring what happens when clinicians are using AI rather than having head-to-heads of AI versus clinicians? Uh, my lab focuses on imaging and sensor modalities. There are about 30 members in my group right now, and we work closely with hospitals and industry partners. So I want to give you a taste of what each of these directions entails, and that's what I'll do next. So I wanna start by talking about the algorithms. Early on, we've seen several demonstrations of algorithms that can look at medical images or sensor data and be able to detect pathologies at the level of experts. On the left, we did that for chest X-rays in 2018. And on the right, we did that for single lead ECGs um, um, and showed that they performed, uh, were able to detect arrhythmias at the level of cardiologists. The challenge over the past few years and what's been very exciting for the field is how do you develop uh, algorithms that don't require that many labeled examples? And I wanna show you a few examples here. So here uh, we're looking at chest X-rays and asking, can we develop self-supervised learning algorithms that uh, are able to reduce the amount of labeled data we need to a smaller fraction? And that's what we showed. Um, we can apply these same ideas to electrocardiograms this time using our knowledge of um, how the ECGs are um, captured to be able to enable us to do this label efficiency well. We can combine two different modalities here. We're combining the image modality for chest x-rays with the language modality that describe what's going on in the chest x-ray by a radiologist. And finally, uh, we're looking at how to make these techniques broadly applicable here, applying them to lung and heart sounds to be able to once again, use a very small number of labeled examples. On the open benchmark curation front, it's been clear over many years, whether outside the domain of medicine or inside of domain of medicine, that large well-labeled data sets can help take us a long way. And the focus of um, several groups over the past uh, couple of years 
has been how do we help the community transparently measure advancements in the generalizability of these algorithms to new geographies, to new patient populations, and to new clinical settings. And on this front, I want to share a few examples with you. So one in which we created a data set that allow us to measure how deep learning models do on uh, chest x-ray films rather than on digital chest x-rays. What happens when we take these large language models that are being developed and apply them to make treatment decision recommendations for patients? And what happens when we vary the patient demographic in a vignette? Uh, is there bias that these algorithms have? And is that bias getting worse or better with time? Um, how do we extract all of the content of medical reports while leaving the style of um, medical report or the patient information out of um, extracting what we care about? And one solution or set of solutions we're developing is extracting knowledge in the form of a graph from these uh, text reports. Finally, when we are developing models to be able to classify diseases, how good are these models at being able to localize diseases in comparison with how uh, experts localize these diseases? Finally, on the front of human AI collaboration, it's been clear that when we give tools in the hands of uh, clinicians, that some people benefit and some people don't benefit from the use of artificial intelligence. And the focus of the past couple of years has been how do you optimize human AI collaboration in the context of these clinical workflows and the places that we're gonna deploy these algorithms. And on this front, some of the things that uh, we are looking at includes what happens when you have clinical information, what form of assistance should you provide a, um, a clinician, and who then benefits uh, from the use of these AI tools when we're piloting them um, in, um, in these control trials. Okay, now that I've um, shared an overview of each of these directions, uh, I want to dive in and chat about some of the most exciting advancements and also opportunities in each of these directions. So let me start by talking about label efficient medical AI. So there have been rapid advances if you look at medical AI tasks over the last five years. There are over 100 FDA cleared technologies. Um, a lot in radiology and cardiology. There are lots of randomized control trials now in gastroenterology, in ophthalmology, and there are at least two CMS covered uh, AI algorithms, the use of which can be associated with um, a fee. And these are in the fields of ophthalmology and radiology. But if we think about what it's gonna take to be able to have algorithms that can do the same set of tasks that an expert can do in their workflows. It's difficult and expensive to scale the way we've been developing these algorithms because it's difficult and expensive to scale labeling for every task. And there are two methods I'd like to talk about to tackle this bottleneck, one of which has been the predominant paradigm over the past many years, transfer learning, and then an emerging a uh, set of methods called self-supervised learning. So let me start with transfer learning. The goal of which is let's have a uh, convolutional neural network first learn to be able to recognize um, classes in the natural world. So looking at uh, images of the world and saying, is this penguin, a cat, or a dog? And then let's use that as a starting point to then be able to look at medical images, your chest x-ray images, and identify whether or not diseases are present or absent in those images by updating this model, the convolutional neural network. So this has been very successful for 2D tasks, but also for 3D tasks. And the way it applies to 3D tasks is you can think of a knee MRI, for instance, which uh, you can see um, the scroll through a patient's knee as a set of um, 2D inputs. On each of those, you can apply uh, these um, networks and then pull 
the um, representations to be able to say for this uh, scan, we know that there's an abnormality or some kind of an ACL tear, a meniscal tear, and we can do uh, this at a pretty high level of accuracy. Okay, so back in 2019, when we were looking at um, applying um, these label efficient algorithms to 3D medical images, we asked the question, if we can apply um, images of penguins as starting points for uh, slices of MRI, could we apply videos uh, to uh, whole sequences of MRI? And that's what we did in this work called AppendixNet, where we said, let's start by having a model first learn to identify human activities in videos, and let's use that as a starting point to then be able to uh, fine tune the network to be able to identify appendicitis in uh, abdominal CT scans. Um, and we showed that with this first step of pre-training, we're able to have a big boost in accuracy compared to not having uh, the pre-training. And this is true uh, even for other 3D architectures or even better than the uh, 2D architectures that one could use for this task. And this applies broadly. We've applied it to different kinds of medical uh, 3D data and different tasks and found uh, this benefit to hold there as well. I also want to talk about self-supervised learning, um, which has been an emerging paradigm for label efficient learning. The idea being, if in conventional supervised learning, we're using label medical data, and in transfer learning, we're typically using natural data as a starting point for then applying to label medical data, why don't we use unlabeled medical data as a starting point for then being able to fine tune a model on labeled data. This initial task of how to learn from unlabeled data is called a pretext task. And then uh, the fine tuned part is called the downstream task. And this is often the task of interest. So how do you set up this pretext task using unlabeled data? Well, let me illustrate an example using um, outside of the context of medicine, which is we have two photos of the same person uh, and then two photos of different people. We're gonna call two photos of the same person a positive pair and the two photos of different people a negative pair. And then we're gonna embed them all in space. Um, and this embedding space is going to be such that the distance between the photos of the same person are gonna be closed while the distance between um, the photos of different people is going to be large. And then we can fine tune this model to say, actually, you know, this photo of a person, this person is Einstein. All right, so how do you apply this idea to the context of medicine? Well, you can apply it to, um, you can apply it to lung and heart sounds by saying, here's a spectrogram that records someone's uh, lung sound, and then you can create two different photos by masking out different parts of the input, and then say, I want to maximize the agreement between these two augmentations of an image, and the same idea can apply to chest x-ray images as well. Um, and you can apply similar ideas to other kinds of data, and this time also think about physiological insight. So I can say, I know the ECG captures the 3D electrical activity of the heart. What would the electrical activity of the heart be if I rotated the heart a little bit and then reprojected back to ECG space? Uh, would I be able to now say, these two are a positive pair? The future here is in uh, having different uh, data sources uh, be used to set up these uh, self-supervised learning tasks. And let me share a an example of this. So one idea that we have been um, pioneering is combining images of chest x-rays with reports of chest x-rays, and then saying, uh, I can learn to associate these images with these reports. And now if I have um, a disease I want to predict, I simply make a uh, text um, describing that disease, and then I match it with the image to see whether or not uh, that disease exists in the image. And this is zero shot learning. And we show that using zero label examples, we're able to rival the performance of experts 
on detecting a wide variety of different uh, pathologies from the medical image. And you can use these um, models even for tasks like radiology report generation, where you say, I'm going to match images, uh, image embeddings with text embeddings and find the text embeddings that most closely uh, represent the image embedding and output that as the report for this particular image. I want to talk now about clinician AI collaboration to share some of the challenges with combining AI tools with clinician interpretation. So the paradigm shift that we want to see here is how do we compare, how do we go from comparing models versus clinicians on a controlled data set to what happens when I give this model to a clinician? How does their performance compare with when they do not receive the model assistance in a mimic workflow? Uh, one idea here um, that we started with is saying, if we provide a simple probability value for abnormality or specifically an ACL tear or an MCL tear to a radiologist, how would their performance change compared to if they were reading this uh, knee MRI without any form of assistance? And so we can set up this study where we are looking at cases with model assistance and without and with a period of two weeks uh, in between, we're asking uh, these uh, radiologists and orthopedic surgeons to randomly read um, either the cases with model assistance first or without first uh, and measure the difference there. So here we can see the specificity, sensitivity, and accuracy with model assistance. And you can see that in terms of statistically significant improvements, you can see that there is an increase in the specificity for detecting an ACL tear of about 0.05. So what this means is out of 100 people who don't have an ACL tear, we're now able to detect five more of them correctly uh, compared to not having assistance. And this has big implications in terms of uh, cutting uh, the um, number of people who have unnecessary surgeries, for example. Okay, so we know that that can lead to a decrease increase in specificity, but one of the challenges here is that we have a black box algorithm. And really, you might say, as a radiologist, you might want to know uh, why a uh, particular uh, prediction is being made. So let's recast the problem. Let's say now we're going to say where in the image there is a problem. And we're going to change the setup to be for head CTA. So these are. Um, these are used to evaluate whether patients have um, aneurysms, which are ballooning's of the blood vessel in the brain, uh, which, if ruptured, could uh, lead to problematic um, outcomes for patients. So we want to detect them, uh, so we can uh, we can intervene. Um, in the assisted setup, you see this um, bright red spot over the sections of the image where the model is suspected there to be an aneurysm. And we're gonna see in a similar setup how this helps uh, clinicians when they're looking at cases with and without um, assistance. And you can see here, there is an increase in sensitivity and specificity. The increase in sensitivity is significant. And this is a pretty big increase in terms of um, the overall improvement. But one of the questions here was, does everyone have an improvement or do some people benefit more than others? And I wanna direct your attention to accuracy in particular, where you can see Radiologist 4 has had the biggest increase in performance going from the lowest performance, while Radiologist 5 has had the smallest increase in performance starting with the highest performance. So could AI tools be a sort of equalizer of sorts between radiologists. And this is a hypothesis that is important to test in the context of what a radiologist is able to see beyond just the image. So here we looked at a study in which we were able to, um, we, we had a task in which um, the uh, clinicians had to determine whether a, a patient had active tuberculosis based on a combination of their lab values and a chest X-ray for HIV positive patients. 
And so they looked at the uh, some patients uh, with assistance as seen on the left and some patients without assistance as seen on the right. Uh, importantly, one of the things we did in the study was we allowed clinicians to calibrate to the model output by saying for some cases right after um, right after you make a uh, prediction, you get the true diagnosis uh, set using a microbiological standard uh, right then and there. And this is before you start uh, the experiment. This is just as training cases. So you're able to calibrate to the performance of the model. Now, even after this, what we realize is that uh, there is an increase in the performance of the clinicians, most uh, specifically with sensitivity. But the surprising part of the study was that the standalone algorithm had an accuracy of 0.79, which was a big increase over even assisting the clinicians. Now, this is very surprising. If you look at individual performances, you see that there is huge variability in terms of whether or not a clinician actually even benefits with AI. Now, this could be a mistrust in the algorithm output or overconfidence in one's own diagnosis. But I hope the takeaway here can be that this idea that expert level AI leads to improved clinician performance is uh, misguided. And the future needs to take into account experience levels, clinician interaction, the case difficulty, and the automation bias that we have to also think about. I wanna talk last here about open benchmark curation. Um, we know that medical data set curation is hard. It requires partnerships with hospitals. It requires IT frameworks to de-identifying and pulling data, and it requires expensive manual annotation. And um, we have over the past several years been uh, focused on trying to make data that's high quality available at scale to uh, the world for practitioners to be able to develop and validate algorithms. Uh, and we've done this for chest x-rays, for bone x-rays, for knee MRIs. And we've learned a lot about how to model uh, chest x-rays or knee MRIs uh, optimally. Some of the things we have learned include, it's important to think about the disease hierarchy. It's important to think about the uncertainty uh, of the labels in terms of building good solutions um, based on machine learning here. In some ways, the gap that's left to fill for the community is huge in that data sets that are currently out there are toy task setups. There are lots of ways in which this is true. The fact that they have poor coverage of diseases, heterogeneity in patients, generalization across clinical workflows, clinical context not being used or priors not being used. I want to share some of the ways in which we are trying to take the first steps towards filling in these gaps. Let me start with poor coverage of diseases. Here you're seeing um, a medical report on the left, a radiology report in particular, and we're annotating that medical report with a few different things. We're saying, what are different observations in that report? What are different entities and how are they linked to each other? And based on that, we can create that graph on the right, which contains all of the important information describing this patient's state without actually um, expressing any elements of style or any elements of um, a personally identifiable information in the graph on the right. And we're able to this way convert uh, reports into this graphical format. Um, and we've done so for 200,000 plus reports um, on called the RADGRAPH benchmark. Another gap that we have attempted to fill is how do we go about applying models to images of um, or photos of chest x-rays? And this is especially useful in um, parts of the world where uh, chest x-rays are not digital, but uh, are taken on films. Of course, just applying machine learning algorithms to this kind of data out of the box does not work. We see a drop in performance. And one of our challenges was how do we enable this performance gap to be filled? Is there any way that we can generate uh, data that simulates these deployment settings 
to be able to improve the robustness of these algorithms to these new distributions. And that's what we've done and released a data set to the world that allows for this uh, advancements to be measured. Finally, I'll talk about poor heterogeneity in patients. And one of the things that we're doing here is creating a large uh, validation consortium for validation of AI models that currently has about 20 collaborators spanning uh, several cities, countries, and continents. Uh, and this is rapidly growing. Uh, if you are a uh, radiologist or a medicine researcher, or if you think you can contribute and facilitate this data sharing, our first collaboration is building a more diverse chest radiograph data set. Um, and I encourage you to reach out and join at the email uh, here, chest underscore consortium at hms.harvard.edu. Um, and I want to end here by just sharing some of the ways in which we're playing an active role in the medical AI transformation, encouraging people to get involved. Uh, one of the things we're doing is uh, we have a medical AI boot camp, which is a training program for students at Harvard and Stanford to get involved in research. But more widely, if you're interested in learning more about these concepts at a technical level, you can uh, look at a uh, massive open online course on Coursera called AI for Medicine, which I helped develop. Uh, if you're interested in what's going on in the industry side of things, um, I co-host uh, the AI Health podcast. And if you're interested in keeping track with the latest in AI research, then the Dr. Penguin AI Health newsletter is, um, is uh, something you can check out. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and um, and um, I have enjoyed sharing uh, all of these exciting uh, pieces um, or pieces that have excited me over the last few years with you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Maggie Delano. And on behalf of myself and Kendra Albert, I'd like to thank you for coming to our talk, uh, which will be about sex trouble, challenges, and opportunities for trans inclusive medical AI. So before we get started, just a quick content warning. Uh, we're going to be discussing weight, weight, weighing, no numbers, body fat percentage, no numbers, uh, and medical transphobia. A little bit about us before we get into it. So I'm an assistant professor of engineering at Swarthmore College. My background is in biomedical engineering and electrical engineering, and I build hardware that is used for machine learning purposes. Um, and also Kendra, who's uh, not with us today, is a uh, clinical instructor at Harvard Law School Cyber Law Clinic, where they focus on technology law. Um, and they also have a background in adversarial machine learning research. Um, so today, together, we have background in biomedical space and uh, machine learning, which is why we're giving this talk about uh, medical machine learning. All right, so before we dive deeper, I wanna sort of start with the story behind how the two of us got involved in this project and this was built upon in a conference paper that we presented at the Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency Conference in 2021. So it starts with uh, an encounter with this Wythings weight scale, um, which Kendra asked me to set up an account for them on. And so uh, as I got through starting to set up the account, um, the, we quickly noticed that there was an issue. Um, Kendra is non-binary. And so when I was presented with the option of either gender pants wearing, gender skirt wearing, which we assume means man or woman, uh, we didn't necessarily know what to pick because Kendra identifies as non-binary. And so I asked them, well, what would you like me to pick? And they said, well, just pick something and we'll figure it out later. So I picked, uh, oh, this is a, dis this is a disaffordance for non-binary people, which means that they encounter something and they don't necessarily know what value they should actually choose. And then in order to use the system, they have to pick something. So in this case, I, Kendra said, please just pick something and don't tell me what it is. So I picked skirt wearing for them. And then they stepped on the scale and we saw a body fat percentage value. Um, and then we kind of looked at it and we're like, I'm not sure if that seems right, just based on what we know about body composition. So we were both kind of curious what would happen if we changed the gender to pants wearing instead. So we changed it to pants wearing instead, and then the body fat percentage dropped 10%. And I work with bioimpedance, which is the technology that the weight scale is based on. So I kind of had a sense of what might've been happening, but it was especially confusing for Kendra because they were like, why would the gender that I select uh, affect the results, and also why would it affect it in such a significant way? So 10% body fat is a really big change. 
And so this kind of began our journey to look into how sex and gender information are encoded into algorithms and then what the implications of that might be for transgender and non-binary people who might not fit the mold for a binary sex or a binary gender. So in this talk, we'll begin by talking about what we're calling algorithmic exclusion in bioelectrical impedance analysis. So it's the technology and the weight scales. Uh, then we'll talk about sex, gender, and medical machine learning. And then I'll talk a little bit about paths forward. So first we'll talk about algorithmic exclusion and bioelectrical impedance analysis. Um, in order to do that, it's helpful to understand what BIA is. So what it does is it measures the electrical properties of tissue, it's called bioimpedance, by driving a small painless current through the body. It uses demographic anthropometric information, so age, weight, height, sex, et cetera, along with the measurement, the bioimpedance, to fit a model to estimate what's called fat-free mass, which is basically all, all of the fat in the body, or all the stuff that's not fat in the body, and then in turn from that, you can estimate the body fat percentage because you have the person's weight. So in order to do this, they use a pretty simple algorithm. So it's basically just a linear regression where you have uh, these different factors. So this case here, we have a constant factor over here. And then we have H squared over R, where H is the height. R is the resistance, which is the real part of the measured bioimpedance. Then we have the weight, which is also a factor, X, which is the reactance or the imaginary part of the bioimpedance, and then this factor here. So we can see that sex is encoded as a binary, so men equals one, women equals zero. So there's an offset depending on the person's sex by 4.229 degree units for this is kilograms uh, in terms of the amount of fat-free mass that this person might have. Um, and so when Kendra's body fat percentage changed when they used the weight scale, we suspect that this might have been something that was happening. So this equation that I'm showing you here is not necessarily the equation that's inside the Wything scale because we can't have access to that scale, uh, scales equations, but something like that is probably what's going on. And so one of the big things that we see here is that there's using the word sex, but then using men and women. And so this is a very common slippage between sex, so male, female, and gender, so men and women, that we will talk about more. But one of the reasons that I think this is an especially interesting example is because it's very obvious when you look at the equation what the effect of sex is doing and how changing a person's sex value will influence the results. However, in a machine learning context, this could be much more complicated. Um, and so it really shows how important it is to kind of understand and how just using this one variable is really standing in for a lot of things, as we'll talk about in a minute. But so based on the BIA equation that we talked about before, one thought that Kenner and I immediately had was, well, they asked for gender, but maybe what they really meant was sex or you know, presumably sex assigned at birth. So our first thought was, well, what if you just change and say, if this had said sex instead, would that be correct? And kind of the process of engaging with this and thinking, well, were they asking for sex? Did they mean sex? What does sex actually mean? Is something that uh, Kendra and I in a more recent paper are, are calling sex confusion. So it leads to a lot of questions like, how was sex evaluated in the research papers used to construct by AI algorithms? So when they asked for gender or sex, what were they actually asking for? Were they asking for the sex that a person was assigned at birth? Were they asking for something that would represent their current physiology? It, it's really unclear. And then it kind of takes the next step, which is which sexual characteristics are relevant to body fat percentage estimation? So when we looked into it more, we realized that this binary value is basically standing in for the fact that there's a dimorphic difference in, in body fat distribution and body composition between cisgender men and cisgender women on average. And so by having that offset, that's meant to capture that dimorphic distribution. But that's doing a lot of work with just one variable. Um, additionally, it doesn't really describe how all of this might be influenced by gender, especially if someone's gender does not match the sex that they were assigned at birth. 
Um, and there could also be lots of other social phenomena that could be relevant. There could also be other demographic and things like race or ethnicity, age, et cetera, all these things that could be relevant that are not necessarily accounted for in the equation. And so one of the big conclusions that we took away from this was that just adding a third option that would be, you know, a pants slash skirt wearing option or some sort of non-binary gender option, well, it might make the user feel more affirmed in the fact that they don't have to choose an option that isn't correct for them. It actually doesn't address the underlying issue of which, of how to develop an algorithm that would actually work for someone's physiology if they were not binary or transgender. And so, just this kind of step, although really important for creating affirmative, affirming care, doesn't actually solve the underlying problem, which is tied to the medical algorithms themselves. So uh, Ken and I call this a rainbow band-aid. So it's, 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 not, it's not sufficient. And that's what a major challenge of this area is, is that there's a lot of things that are deep, more deeply rooted that need to be addressed. So I'm going to turn my attention specifically to medical machine learning to talk about how some of these same things show up in machine learning contexts. So this is based on work that Kendra and I uh, recently submitted to Cell Patterns. So um, it's under review right now. So hopefully when it's published, you uh, will be able to read it. Um, but so one of the things we talk about in the paper and that's reflected in our research is that sex and gender are often conceived of as binary, static, and concordant. Basically what this means is that sex is assumed to have one of two values, male, female. Similarly, gender is assumed to have one of two or two values, men, man and woman. These are static, so once they're assigned at birth, they're considered to be the same over time. And they're also assumed to be concordant. So sex of male, female should map to gender of man, woman, so male, man, female, woman. And then that would explain why we see that slippage, which we also see a lot in machine learning. So for example, to take the MIMIC3 clinical database, we see this gender field that has FM. And when we reviewed over 30 machine learning papers, we saw this trend a lot. We think that they were actually using the sex field from electronic health records, but they call it gender. And again, like the white, 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 white CL, maybe they're calling it gender in some way to try to be progressive or inclusive, but they're not actually measuring someone's gender identity. They're measuring their sex, presumably their sex assigned at birth or whatever sex value is in the EHR, which might not actually be their sex assigned at birth. We don't know. Um, this can lead to a lot of issues when trying to draw conclusions based on model results. So, for example, um, in a recent paper that was looking at gender differences um, in the diagnosis and management of coronavirus, um, we saw a couple things. So, uh, for example, on the left, we say, finally, ovarian hormones influence inflammation, immunity, and many other aspects of women's health. And so here we're talking about an important potential mechanism that might be related to to the disease, which is ovarian hormones, but then we're attributing those to women. So many women have ovarian hormones, but they also might have hormones to various degrees. Also, some women might not have ovarian hormones, or people who are women uh, who aren't women also have ovarian hormones. So it's there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one link there. Um, Additionally, there's a discussion of gender, which actually is probably a really important thing to discuss, but when you have sex from an EHR field, you don't have someone's gender identity, you have their sex. So you can't necessarily make conclusions about things like that they're more likely to be a primary caregiver within a household based on the sex information alone. Um, one of the other things that we saw when we were looking at uh, a lot of medical machine learning papers is the idea that ultimately sex is the relevant variable for purposes of clinical research. And this usually defaults to discussing sex assigned at birth. A major reason for this is most likely because of the fact that historically sex assigned at birth was the only information that was available in electronic health records, um, especially until the last few years. So even if people wanted to include different information, they might not necessarily have had access to it. Um, but one of the things we talk about in the paper is the fact that even adding things like gender identity are really basically to get people to leave that sex field alone so that people know the sex assigned at birth 
even if the sex of sign of birth might not actually be the relevant factor for person. So basically what we're saying is that sex is acting as a stand-in for a very, very wide range of variables and which variables it's standing in for really depend on the research application, but it could be standing in for things like gender identity, sexual orientation, hormones levels, presence or absence of reproductive organs, appearance and type of genitalia, secondary sex characteristics, body composition, karyotypes, and it could also stand in for other social factors like income level or occupation. And so when you're using a machine learning model and you're putting in sex, thinking that that's sort of like this simple binary value, you're actually having it stand in for so many of these different var variables. And there's a lot of complexity that's being lost. And this will have a disproportionate impact on people for whom a lot of the assumptions or the stand-in factors don't apply. So this is something that we're calling algorithmic exclusion, which is the idea that not only that the complexity is being ignored, but the consequence of that complexity and the lack of reporting or explaining how sex is being used is that non-binary and transgender people might not even be present in data sets, or if they are, there's no way to know and there's no way to consider for them. So for example, if we only have access to binary sex, we have no idea if any of the people in that study were transgender or not and how their, for how their results may or may not be different from cisgender people. Um, additionally, in a lot of these cases, the details of the algorithms are not disclosed. Um, so you can't necessarily run an, your own analysis. And even if you could, um, you, you don't always have the resources to do that. So basically, if every AI model that is being developed is exclusive of transgender people, anytime someone wants to use one of those results with someone who's transgender, they have to say, well, does this apply? Does this not apply? It's a big burden. Um, and so the other thing to think about is that although our research has focused a lot on non-binary and transgender people, the same kind of ideas apply in lots of other demographic situations. So in particular, like with the weight scale, when we showed the fat free mass equation, that particular equation also didn't account for anything related to race and ethnicity. Something like this could also affect all people of color, although it does depend a lot because some research suggests that body composition varies based on ethnicity. Other things suggest that it doesn't. It really depends and it's pretty complicated. Um, and the other things that, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily account for the experiences in body fat part composition doesn't necessarily account for people who um, might have much higher body fat percentages um, or people who are elderly or people who otherwise have sex characteristics that don't match their gender. So basically these assumptions are aggregate ones and they break down in a lot of different circumstances, not just for non-binary and transgender people. The implications of this are significant, although it might not be something that can easily be measured. So one of the big things is, is we talk about with the algorithmic exclusion component is that there's under or misrepresentation in clinical research studies. We don't know how many transgender people are in a lot of these studies, and we don't know what the implications of that are. Um, and that can have consequences for patient care. So one of the specific ways that this can happen is the use of inappropriate reference ranges. So anything from lab tests to inputs to models there could be worse care because it's not known like what a normal or healthy value would look like for a transgender person. It can also lead to denial of care based on sex gender, which is more of a billing issue than an AI issue, but still an important one. It can also lead to a lot of psychological impacts about, of the algorithmic exclusion from new generation of medical tools. So especially as machine learning models become more and more integrated into systems, People are going to be asked information uh, or that information is going to be extracted from their electronic health record. And there's always going to be the question of, did this account for my physiology? Are they going to know what they need to know in order for me to get the best care that I need? So now I'd talk to talk a little bit about what we see some of the paths forward are. So I hinted at it a little bit earlier, but there are some positive developments, which is that now um, it's becoming more and more common for gender identity and also sexual orientation to be included in electronic health records. And so this leads to a better experience for transgender people in terms of not being misgendered, especially if there's also, they're also recording like a preferred name uh, and pronouns. However, this really doesn't go far enough because it doesn't consider the fact of what we just talked about is so now you have sex MF 
and you have gender identity, which could have a whole wide range of options. But even those two things alone don't necessarily tell you what's actually relevant to the research question. And moving forward really requires uh, a major reframe of how we think about design. Um, and so one of the ways to think about this is the importance of designing from the margins. And this is a reference to an excellent report from Afsana Rago, and I included the link down below. But so when we design systems, especially these systems, they've been designed for cisgender people where it's not necessarily a bad assumption that you know, one sex variable can stand in for so many of these different values, although it's not necessarily a great situation for cisgender people either. But this means that the system is designed for the general users, the people who fit in within the black circle here. And then everyone else who is outside that circle, basically we're not designing for them. But instead, if we think of the people who are decentered, who are in the blue space outside here, if we're designing for them, we're also then, de then designing for everyone inside as well. So by reframing and thinking about how we can design better for transgender people, we can actually design better for everyone. In that aim, we have a couple of concrete recommendations. So the first one is to educate yourself, if you aren't, haven't already, about sex, gender, and the experiences of transgender people inside and outside medical machine learning contexts. So it's really important to get a sense of how transgender people are engaging with the medical system more broadly, especially the way that the medical system uh, and legal system really police what it means to be transgender and how transgender people get access to medical care, because um, this has a big, this is tied very deeply to the kinds of information that transgender people are willing to provide to medical um, professional providers, and that will influence what machine learning researchers have access to. Um, it's also important to work in teams with a range of competencies, especially those familiar with EHR, schema, and transgender health. So one of the things that we did as we were conducting our research was that we talked to experts on electronic health records, and they really emphasized that it's really important for researchers to make sure that they talk to people who understand the data sets because it might say that this variable means one thing, but doesn't actually necessarily mean that it's used in a different way. Like electronic health records are not designed primarily for research. So it's really important that if you're using them, you understand where the data are coming from. Um, also, similarly, it's important to work with people who have experience with transgender health because they can help you make the right decisions in terms of what potential variables to include, which we'll talk about in a second as well. Um, and the third thing is to determine whether and which sex gender data are relevant to research, focusing on, quote, data richness. So data richness is a term from Prepsac et al. 2018. And basically that what they say is that it's important to move beyond the idea of just like the presence or absence of some sort of condition. In their case, they were talking about diabetes, and it's not just does this person have diabetes or do they not have diabetes? It's when did they get diabetes? How long, so that, and therefore how long have they had that for? what uh, are their A1C levels, like those kinds of things. Uh, there's also a focus on data richness. So the way that we kind of think about approaching this is that you choose metrics related to sex gender that are appropriate for the specific project. So in this case, especially avoiding using binary sex gender. One of the important things to think about is to assume a biosocial explanation for physiological differences unless evidence clearly suggests otherwise. This is why we use the word sex slash gender because there's a lot of research that actually shows that social factors have a much larger influence on our physiology than we might think. Like we might think of sex as physiological and gender as social, but the two are actually much more deeply entwined. Um, also acknowledge and work with transgender and non-binary patients and how their experience might be different from other patients. So just by talking to a transgender person, if you don't already, you will learn a lot about what things might be relevant and what might not be. Also, you can use organ and anatomic inventories when they are available and advocate for better electronic health record systems or data sets if these kinds of things aren't available. So for example, if it would be relevant for your research to have access to hormone levels or to know if someone has ovaries or not, this is the kind of thing that would be useful to consult this database about. Um, one of the important things when you start to think about this is to triage based on how your results might be used for clinical decision making. So, for example, we reviewed a paper that was involved in anesthesia monitoring and they had 
uh, probably 30 variables, many of which were from different hardware devices. And the important thing to think about here is, you know, this is a life and death kind of thing. So it's important to evaluate each of these different hardware systems. Um, if you're doing a research only study, the, the stakes are a little bit lower, but that doesn't mean it's not important. And then also certainly if an ML model is gonna be used as a sole decision maker, which is fortunately not very common in medicine, it's especially important to make sure that you're making sure that these devices don't have hidden biases in them. Um, when you do con conduct a study, it's important to document the use of sex gender variables clearly, including specific fields used, how they were gathered, how change, use change, changed over time, and what the possible values are. So F, M, uh, intersex, unknown, these kinds of things. Uh, additionally, conducting data quality checks, uh, especially when there's multiple different sex gender fields, so for example, sex assigned at birth, legal sex, administrative sex, sometimes in EHR systems, there's different options for those and make sure they all make sense and align um, and have strategies for handling missing data. Uh, additionally, considering bias from sources other than sex and gender identity fields, which I kind of alluded to before. So especially if you're working with you know, other models or if, you're, or if you're collecting data from hardware systems, like those systems might have their own biases built into them. Um, and the main way to evaluate that is to audit the model performance for subgroups, um, especially but doing so without presuming or essentializing differences. So don't necessarily presume that transgender people are different, but you need to have a way to account for the fact that they might be and their care might require something different from cisgender people. So thank you very much for listening to our presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, uh, also feel free to reach out to us over email. Thanks for listening. Hello, everyone. My name is Gregor Stiglitz, and I'm coming from University of Maribor. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for kindly inviting me uh, to speak today uh, about improving trust in explainable AI uh, with some use cases from primary care. Uh, before I start, uh, I would like to say that I'm very, very sorry that we cannot be uh, in some live events uh, where we could meet face to face and uh, exchange some ideas, uh, have some discussion, but uh, I'm sure that in the future uh, we will also have the opportunities to do this. So this time I'm providing my talk uh, as a pre-recorded talk. Uh, so let's start uh, with... Uh, the first slide. Uh, I will speak mostly today uh, about the prediction models. So uh, as we all know, the prediction uh, models are based on some uh, inputs that we give in and we expect some useful output to uh, get out of those uh, models, uh, usually predicting some uh, value. Uh, so uh, because uh, the, the fact that all the prediction uh, models are built on some data. I will fir first uh, speak about the data and uh, how this is uh, connected uh, with the trust uh, or getting trust from the healthcare uh, experts. So my group is uh, mostly working uh, uh, in, on type 2 diabetes uh, screening tools uh, that are uh, AI supported and are deployed uh, in the uh, preventive healthcare uh, clinical environment uh, in the primary healthcare field. So uh, first uh, I will present a short uh, little study that was done approximately 10 years ago. Uh, we started with two healthcare centers uh, in Slovenia, uh, preventive healthcare centers where uh, usually the healthcare experts, that is uh, GPs and uh, nurse practitioners, um, try to uh, try to advise, uh, to uh, give advice to, to patients, uh, so to healthy individuals who uh, <coughs> come for uh, the healthcare checkups. Uh, and uh, this was uh, our first study of this kind, where we uh, had this direct, uh, direct contact with uh, healthcare experts who helped us in uh, first collecting data and then uh, doing some useful research that will be useful for uh, both sides, of course. So um, it all starts with the data, as I mentioned. Uh, so in this case, we were, uh, let's call it manually collecting, collected, uh, collecting, we were collecting the data. So uh, 
in, in, in this uh, study where we collected data from uh, a little bit more than 600 individuals participating in this study. Uh, all this collection of the data uh, took more than uh, 190 uh, hours of work uh, for five students that were involved and uh, it, it took a lot of effort and time to do it. So in the end, we were able to produce some uh, visualizations. Uh, initially, we, we tried to test uh, or to show uh, how, uh, how good uh, or what is the performance of the prediction model or a screening model that, that they were uh, currently using. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, our important message for the healthcare uh, experts working in those uh, centers uh, was uh, that uh, different threshold values should be uh, set for male and female because they were using uh, all the same, you know, they were using the same thresholds for 30 years. So, but as we know, the population changes, the characteristics of the population changes. And of course, we wanted to offer them uh, something more. Uh, so this was the, or let's call it initial step to gaining trust from uh, these uh, healthcare experts. Uh, so uh, we showed them that it's possible to do a lot with collected data, but at the same time, when, when, when we were uh, working on this study, uh, there were similar, similar studies in other countries that worked with millions of, of uh, patients, uh, while, as you could see, in our case, we were uh, using uh, just hundreds of patients. So we, know that, uh, we knew that uh, the data is already collected in uh, uh, electronic health care records. Uh, this kind of data was collected uh, since 2013 in, in our case. But of course, uh, there were many, many obstacles that we have to uh, had to pass to get to this kind of data. Uh, but of course, the reward was great on the other uh, side because there, uh, at the moment there are more than 800 such uh, family medicine practices uh, that uh, uh, are collecting the data that we were uh, interested in. So we were trying to collect the data that would allow us to predict whether uh, a healthy individual will have problems or uh, we, tried to, we tried to estimate the risk uh, for this, uh, uh, this patient for different kinds of chronic conditions. Um, usually we focused on diabetes, but we also uh, had some other kinds of uh, prediction models uh, in development. Uh, so we started with nine healthcare centers in 2016, uh, where we were able to get the data in electronic form. But what we found out was that there was a lot of uh, missing data there. Uh, so for, just for comparison, when we were manually uh, collecting the data, there were around 13% uh, of uh, missing data. While on the other hand, in the uh, electronic healthcare records, there were some healthcare centers where we could record up to 90% uh, or even more uh, percent of uh, missing data. So we had a huge task to do uh, to somehow bring the healthcare experts in and uh, show them uh, how, uh, uh, how important it, it is to enter the data in the system that of course, they are collecting, but they were not entering all the all the data in the system. So uh, this is uh, not something that would be the uh, explainability of the uh, of the prediction model itself or or the or the decisions of the prediction model, but we were offering them uh, explainability of uh, using the prediction models on different kinds of data. So different kinds of data uh, by this, I mean data with different uh, percentage of missing data. Uh, so in this uh, study, we then showed uh, uh, how uh, what, what is the difference when you have uh, almost complete data and on the other side, uh, where there is a lot of missing data. Uh, we also conducted some um, educational workshops for uh, healthcare experts, uh, where we uh, again uh, gained some trust, uh, if uh, I call it like uh, this, uh, to um, uh, to get to get the healthcare experts uh, more involved in what we were doing next. So uh, we were building uh, a prediction model. 
uh, on the Slovenian population data. So we uh, on the data that uh, had all the characteristics that were important for our envi environment. Uh, so uh, in this case, again, we got the trust from the healthcare experts, but maybe just to the point where uh, this experimental part, this uh, research study ended. And when we uh, wanted to integrate uh, those uh, newly developed uh, prediction models, AI-based prediction models, uh, into the clinical practice. There we usually stopped. So uh, someone had uh, objections, uh, someone wanted to know more, someone wanted us to, to show them more about how the prediction models uh, work and why they decided it or why they um, produced some specific output. So then we started some more education in the clinical environment. Uh, we were explaining to the uh, to the healthcare experts uh, what kind of explanations are possible, what kind of prediction models are possible, how they differ between uh, each other. So uh, we were uh, trying to also explain how the local uh, explainability of the prediction models works. So when they can get the uh, the specific details on uh, on decisions for a specific uh, patient, or that we are also able to get some more general no knowledge uh, and do explanation of the prediction models on a more global uh, level. So uh, our next step then was, uh, because it was also, uh, mm, uh, let's say, um, uh, something that uh, the healthcare experts wanted to see, uh, we uh, gave them the opportunity to interact with the prediction model. So they were able to change some, uh, some, uh, some variable uh, levels, uh, some, uh, some uh, feature values. And by changing this, they could see how and why the, the, the prediction models uh, react or response uh, as it is responding. So in a few iterations, uh, we arrived to some uh, user interface that was uh, acceptable, that was then used in the clinical environment. They, they were able to show now the patient uh, how their uh, risk will increase in case uh, some um, lifestyle changes are, are, are taken or if they are not. So uh, this was something that was really useful. And this way, we really gained uh, their uh, trust, uh, I think. So what we are doing uh, now, uh, I'm showing here a triangle. Uh, so this inner part of the triangle is usually met in the project management field. Uh, it shows the, the, the relations between the time, the cost and quality of, a, of developing a project. And of course, uh, uh, transferring the prediction models to clinical practice is also a project. So, uh, I already spoke about this uh, left edge, the left lower edge of this triangle, about uh, gaining uh, trust from the uh, from the healthcare experts that work with uh, patients, of course. And also an important part here because when uh, you are explaining the prediction models uh, decisions, uh, you are doing this directly with the patient. Right? Uh, so uh, the next uh, edge of this triangle is uh, electronic health record or documentation in any any form. Uh, I already spoke uh, about this uh, before. So the importance of collecting the data and the importance uh, of uh, uh, collecting the high quality data. Uh, this uh, lower right uh, tri triangle shows the scientific literature. So maybe you will ask how uh, or where is the place for uh, scientific literature here? So we believe that uh, this uh, scientific literature input uh, into the whole process of explaining the uh, outputs of the prediction models using AI uh, will play an important role uh, in the future. So in the next few years, uh, I believe we can expect uh, um, huge improvements here in this field, which already started with so-called uh, large language models. I believe that most of you has, have already heard about uh, this kind of uh, uh, models. So they're built on a huge amounts of uh, textual data. And of course, they are already used in the healthcare uh, as well. Uh, so here uh, is a 
short example of one of our uh, early studies in this field. So what we were doing here is uh, in, the, in the upper side of this slide, you can see the uh, abstract of a scientific paper uh, from the preventive healthcare field, uh, which uh, uh, we intentionally leave, left out some, uh, some parts of this abstract. So in general, if you would like to get the uh, overall impression of what this study was about, you would need to read a little bit more than is shown here. So a lot of text, if, especially if you have to read 10 or 20 such abstracts each day, so the new literature that's coming in. And of course, we know that healthcare uh, experts do not have time to read uh, that many uh, new uh, papers or abstracts of the papers uh, coming in on a daily basis. So uh, what we are doing here is uh, we are using uh, AI models, so large language models, uh, in this case, five different types of those uh, those models to create, uh, to generate a new text that is actually a summary of this abstract. And this way, we would like to shorten the time that healthcare expert needs to uh, to get the, uh, the information or, or to decide which paper uh, he or she is going to read uh, in more details. Uh, but uh, even here, uh, the question of trust uh, again arises. So can we trust the generated text, especially in the uh, sensitive field of uh, healthcare of medicine? So in this case, uh, as uh, just an, as an interesting fact, what we found here in one of the uh, one of the models actually produced the text that uh, should be summary. But when you look at it uh, more closely, you can see that it's actually a review of the uh, text that was in the abstract. So uh, it seems that uh, this large language model was trained on a also large amount of, uh, uh, of reviews of scientific work. So now uh, the summary that uh, should be generated uh, resembles more uh, of a review than uh, of a summary that, that uh, it should uh, represent. Right? So uh, what I want to say is that we are still uh, far away from uh, automatically generating systematic reviews for the healthcare experts, which would be the ultimate goal. Uh, but uh, uh, there are, and there is, there is a lot of research going on at the moment uh, of how we could uh, integrate all those uh, large language models uh, in the uh, in the big picture uh, of uh, explainable AI uh, systems, um, and also in the primary healthcare. This could be. Of great benefit. Uh, I will just uh, spend uh, two more slides uh, on legal aspects of trust in AI because I think I'm the only speaker from the EU here in this section. Uh, I will. Uh, I would mention the initiatives uh, in Europe. So uh, many of you might have heard that uh, last year the European Commission published a so-called proposal for the AI Act, uh, which should uh, somehow put legal. Uh, boundaries around the use of AI in different fields, uh, which also includes the healthcare field, of course. Uh, here, what they did is they, uh, they are trying to apply uh, uh, or, uh, or rank uh, the applications and systems, AI-supported AI systems, into three groups. So uh, first one would be the AI-supported systems that uh, are or will be banned in the EU, so they are unacceptable with the unacceptable high risk. Then high risk systems, and these high risk systems also includes uh, so uh, so called limited risk uh, category, uh, where it would be enough, for example, if you would put a label on your system that uh, that the user is interacting with uh, the AI and not the human. Right? So this would be something, and. Uh, the third group, which would be left uh, unregulated. So uh, those uh, applications where AI does not seem to possess any uh, risk for, uh, for the users. So on one, one side, we have uh, those uh, systems uh, that need to be regulated, that need to be somehow controlled. Uh, while on the other hand, there, there, is, uh, uh, there are initiatives that are uh, explaining or speaking about uh, that 
in the future, in the next, let's say, two, three years, we can expect some fields, uh, even in healthcare uh, medicine, where uh, you will be, uh, well, your obligation will be to use the, the, the AI to, uh, let's say, uh, obtain a diagnosis for uh, a specific patient. One of such fields uh, seems to be the image recognition, where the advances were really great in the last uh, few years. Uh, and the systems there are really improved and in uh, many cases uh, uh, surpass, surpassing the um, performance of the medical experts. And in these cases, uh, it will be just the opposite. So you will need to uh, have the AI integrated in your system to actually work, to actually um, set some diagnosis, for example. Right? Okay, so uh, a lot of interesting times for us ahead, but uh, I think my time is running out. So I will, uh, I will conclude my talk with this uh, last slide. Uh, with uh, this slide, I would like to invite you all to the uh, conference that we are organizing next year. So hopefully there we can see each other face-to-face uh, -face, uh, and speak to each other, uh, which would be much more pleasant than uh, recording a talk up front. Uh, with this, uh, I will conclude uh, for all interested, for all of you interested in uh, topics of the, uh, of the talk I covered today uh, and also about the conference. If there are any uh, questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, just use my uh, email, please. So thanks uh, once again uh, for the kind invitation from the organizers.